One of my favorite things to say is that ecosystems are open systems. In ecosystem science, we're not only looking at the interactions between organisms and their abiotic environment, but also the flux and flow of materials within and across the borders of these systems. So in this lecture, we'll be broadening our study of ecosystems by investigating landscape level processes. So let's get started. Now, I don't have a fancy technical definition of landscape ecology. We're just focusing on the structure and processes that emerge at the landscape level, a level of spatially interconnected systems. Most ecologists do look at it from this perspective, but sometimes you might hear a different definition, one that says landscape ecology is the relationship between biophysical and socioeconomic systems. This is a pretty unique definition because it treats human influence as sort of an unavoidable emergent property at the landscape level. So the focus at these larger spatial scales is the effect of human interactions and disturbances. I consider all of that to fall under the discipline of landscape ecology, uh, but it is a complementary viewpoint since we can apply these perspectives to specific issues in conservation biology and so on. So let's take a step back to our general definition of landscape ecology. When we talk about landscapes, we're talking about structures and processes that fall outside of but still influence individual systems. So heterogeneity or variation is key. We already know that within an ecosystem, there's heterogeneity, the pits and mounds. And at the landscape level, the heterogeneity tends to be a bit more obvious, at least when it comes to vegetation. We can see these greater patch mosaics. In a mosaic of patches, every patch or landscape element is an individual habitat, a relatively homogeneous ecosystem. In a mountain landscape, as an example, the landscape elements include forests, meadows, bogs, streams, ponds, rock outcroppings. But say in an agricultural area, we'll see fields, fence lines, heads rows, patches of woods, and so on. And don't forget our own urban landscapes that might include, well, unnatural features like parks, industrial districts, residential areas, highways, sewage, treatment works, and so on. Now, the term matrix relies, or sorry, excuse me, refers to the underlying system, the one with the greatest area, highest connectivity, and dominant ecological role. In our mountain landscape, that would be the forest, but in the agricultural landscape, we're talking row crops. Regardless, all of the elements in a landscape are connected in one way to another, directly or indirectly. So think back to our biogeochemical cycles and how they interact with the hydrologic cycle. At the landscape level, watersheds, the land that drains rainfall, rivers, and groundwater, that can have a significant influence. I wanted to quickly share this figure with you to highlight a few of these ecological processes and natural histories that enter into the domain of landscape ecology. First of all, many ecosystem services don't actually operate at the scale of an ecosystem, an uh, individual landscape element. For example, water purification and carbon sequestration happen at this geographic scale, and then pollination happens across landscapes. When it comes to natural history, whether an organism is a generalist or a specialist, whether it's sensitive to disturbances, this is all linked to spatial scale. And the same goes for population dynamics. Think source sink or island biogeography theory. The takeaway is, it turns out that spatial context is really important. 
So when we describe the structure of a landscape, there's quite a few spatial variables we'll be using to reference the different aspects of the system. The main ones are patch size, shape, composition, number, arrangement, and interconnectedness. And when it comes to arrangement and interconnectedness, there's a few ways to describe the patterns that make up the landscape. Interspersion refers to the degree that different uh, patches are mixed together. Is the arrangement more random, interspersed, or is it there's there some clustering? Next, we have juxtaposition, which takes into account the composition of neighboring patches. Are patches adjacent to similar habitats, like a forest next to a forested wetland, or are neighboring patches very different from each other, like a forest next to row crops. Finally, we have connectivity. However interspersed the patches are, are they still connected? To what degree might they interact with the underlying matrix and with each other? This is where function becomes very important as well. At the landscape level, we also study the flow of energy, nutrients, and organisms. A corridor is a linear element that connects patches within a landscape. So corridors facilitate many different processes. Also, in human-dominated landscapes, corridors are especially important when it comes to conservation. And then we have time. Temporal context is always important. Disturbance, succession, even really big stuff like glaciation, all of that can influence a landscape. Now, to backtrack just a little bit, corridors are important when it comes to interconnectedness, but borders are important as well, and not for the reason that you might think. Similar patch types can overlap, and the resulting intermediary or in-between habitat is called an ecotone. This is transitional habitat, like a hybrid, and it's here in an ecotone that edge effects occur. So these loose boundaries, really representing a whole continuum of ecosystem types, affect species interactions and community composition. Edge effects don't just include changes in biotic communities. There are abiotic differences too. Light availability, wind, temperature, and soil composition, as a few examples. But in human-dominated systems, there are also increasing levels of fragmentation, stuff breaking apart, missing puzzle pieces. Anyway, this increases the relative amount of ecotone, or edge, habitat with negative consequences. But we'll circle back to that in a, another video. Anyway, I have just one last comment on this topic for now. You can have edge effects without an ecotone. Just think about what the edge of an agricultural field looks like. There's a sharp jump from forest to grassland, or whatever the neighboring habitat type is juxtaposition, right? There's no transitional band with this high degree of juxtaposition. There's no ecotone in that situation. A classical method of measuring patches compares the shape of a patch to a circle. But, hmm, why a circle? Well, a circle has the maximum area for any given perimeter. If we max out our area to perimeter ratio, then we can minimize edge effects. This protects the integrity of the focal habitat, the habitat we're really focusing on. But again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about the applications to conservation in a different video. So for now, let's take a quick look at this equation. The patch shape, S, is characterized as the ratio of the perimeter to the area compared to a circle. So if the patch is perfectly circular in shape, then S is equal to 1. But as the patch becomes less circular, the perimeter increases so S is greater than 1. 
high values of s, meaning that a patch has a ton of perimeter and very little internal area. Now, complex shapes, uh, non-circles, can be described using fractal geometry. This is a lot like using different raster scales in GIS, if you're familiar with that. But there are limitations to this approach. When using fractal geometry to find the perimeter of a complex shape, the size of your ruler matters. In this diagram, we can see how using different rulers gives us different estimates of the coastline of Great Britain. So, whatever, rulers, math, pff, what's the ecological significance? Well, it's like I said before, it turns out that spatial context and perspective is really important. Let's take a look at Admiralty Island which lies just off the coast of southeastern Alaska. Oddly enough, on Admiralty Island, there's a metric crap ton of eagles. Now, they all build their nests right along the coastline. Better fishing, I guess. Eagles doing eagle things. Anyway, since each nest is located about 0.78 kilometers apart, we can use this distance to estimate how eagles perceive the geometry of Admiralty Island. To the eagles, there is roughly 760 kilometers of coastline. So let's look at a different organism, though, and compare their view of Admiralty Island. The humble barnacle. Since each barnacle only uses about two centimeters of coastline, they can colonize even the smallest outcroppings extending into the ocean. So from the barnacle's point of view, this little island is roughly 11,000 kilometers of coastline. So a lot more than what the eagles think there is. In case you're wondering, as we measure it, Admiral Island has about 1,100 kilometers of coastline. So let's all kind of laugh at these stupid eagles and barnacles for a second. <laughs> they don't know. So what matters is how individual organisms perceive and utilize their space, how they measure their geometry. And it matters when we apply this idea to conservation. Think about the Exxon Valdez oil spill, for example. To clean up the coastline, if we're allocating a certain amount of coastline per unit coastline per mile, should we think about the eagles? Should we think about the barnacles? What's our perspective? So it's time to start thinking, uh, linking landscape structure and function. The structure of a landscape affects the flow of energy, materials, and species. For example, bedrock influences how nutrients move from surface to groundwater, which in turn affects primary productivity. Now, the degree of fragmentation within a landscape affects population dynamics. We're talking sources versus sinks or metapopulation dynamics. Similarly, the arrangement and interconnectedness of patches affects dispersal, while size and composition or patch quality affects local population density. The more that patches become fragmented within a landscape, the more that organisms will have to move between them. But even for the most isolated patches, um, we do see a higher degree of persistence. Organisms stay there longer we often see local extinctions as well. This has been experimentally demonstrated with prairie mammals, like, you know, from the textbook, <laughs> uh, but has also been observed for subpopulations of bighorn sheep in mountain ranges in Southern California, Nevada, that whole region. So the mean movement of these organisms is what we would define as their home range. Now, with larger patch sizes, these patches can support larger populations. I mean, that's obvious, right? There's more resources. But the actual population density decreases. So the individuals are a little bit more spread out than if they were in a smaller patch. But isolated patches also support lower population densities because the degree of isolation influences immigration rates. It decreases immigration rates. 
This was shown for the Glanville fritillary in the country, the countryside landscape of southwestern Finland. So small farms, pastures, meadows, and woods, those are the elements that we would have in that landscape. We can also return to the concept that habitat corridors facilitate the movement of species between patches. With corridors, we see an increase in ecosystem services like pollination and seed dispersal. Again, remember, pollination, not an ecosystem service, but occurring at the landscape scale. And of course, there are many other examples of landscape structure, like with lake chemistry. The concentrations of dissolved ions, including micronutrients, all depend on hydrologic flow within an aquatic landscape or water-based landscapes. So during this lecture on landscape structure and processes, I've hinted at some of the factors that create landscapes. So before you go to the next video where we talk about geographic ecology, I want to touch on a few of these landscape, landscape creating processes in more detail. Perhaps the most powerful process that shapes landscapes are geologic processes. Volcanoes, sedimentation, erosion, this physically shapes the entire landscape. But climate, believe it or not, plays a pretty big role as well. Think about biomes, what makes something tundra versus rainforest. There are differences in temperature, precipitation, and seasonality. Wetting and drying cycles themselves including periodic floods, are also powerful drivers of landscape structure. And if we were to look at an interaction between climate and geology, then glaciers are an excellent example. Of course, organisms, animals, plants, whatever, also influence their environment. I mean, we can even talk about bacteria and microbial mats, but there are so many different processes and feedbacks that we could discuss here, but at the most basic level, we should appreciate the role of hmm, the humble plant. They're not just primary producers, but they're also an important link to the nitrogen cycle and decomposition, things that we find important at higher levels of ecology. So ecosystem engineers, not just ecosystem engineers, but landscape engineers. Beavers being a pretty obvious one, humans too, but we'll talk about that another time. Beaver dams, for example, increase the extent of wetlands in the landscape and influence catchment hydrology. They also trap sediment, nutrients, organic matter, and nutrient retention, by the way, is very important because the nitrogen ends up shooting up. Plus, beavers selectively reduce stands of particular species of trees, not just any, actually, yes, not just any tree, but certain trees. Uh, so this can influence the community structure. Now, at one time, beavers modified all temperate valley streams in North America, from the tundra down to the Sonoran Desert. Crazy. Beavers. <laughs> huh? Beavers. But who are our other ecosystem engineers besides humans? Uh... African elephants, for example, knock down trees and can gradually change a woodland to a grassland. Alligators help to maintain ponds in the Florida Everglades. And kangaroo rats, prairie dogs, termites, and even earthworms dig burrows that modify soil structure. All of that influences the entire ecological landscape. Another video next time.